So hello and welcome to the final lecture of this particular course in gender and literature. So we come to a conclusion of this course uh, and I'm just going to give you an overview of what you've done in this course and just give, leave you with some uh, more ideas uh, to probably ponder upon and then you know, uh, you know work on and possibly uh, those of you who are more interested in publishing, uh, you can take these ideas and you know, use those in articles and essays and perhaps also to give you ideas for conference presentations in the times to come. Uh, those, who, those of you who want to have more academic experience out of this particular course. So, uh, just to give you a little, you know, just to repeat a little, you know, a summary version of this course. So, we looked at gender and literature uh, as some kind of a coded behavior, uh, gender as some kind of a coded behavior, uh, and literature, the literary component of this course, are reflections, uh, very complex reflections of those coded behavior. Uh, and different kind of political climates and different kind of ideological climates and different kind of cultural climates. So, uh, the, entire, the entire idea of this course is to give you an idea of how these codes are formed uh, and how this coded quality of gender behavior are formed through a you know, complex combination of ideology, uh, biology, economics, um, cultural conditions, political conditions, ideological conditions, linguistic conditions, racial conditions, religious conditions. So, all coming together to produce a certain kind of idea, a certain idea of gender and gendered behavior, right. And obviously, uh, the combinations change, the codes change, uh, and are depending on and other, other kind of external changes like economic changes. We saw an example of that in um, Shatan Shukhilari, the chess place, where you know that the kind, the, the gendered identity, the gender, the dominant gendered identity and the value system uh, associated with it was on its way out, uh, you know, when uh, the British were coming in and they're bringing in a different kind of uh, gendered identity, a different kind of masculine identity, uh, which would also be, which also affect uh, the feminine identity uh, in, uh, in the times to come. So, you know, we saw that in Shatan Shukhilari. We also saw uh, how the mutability of the gendered identity and the performance of it expected from it uh, is something which is sort of obviously a construct. Uh, so, we, when you read Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell, we saw quite clearly that, you know, you know the entire idea to be an imperial officer was to imbibe or conform uh, to certain codes of conduct, uh, the codes of conduct which are sort of pre-established uh, you know, politically, ideologically, racially, culturally and obviously in this imperial climate. So, the codes of conduct were pre-established in uh, Orwell's essay and the man, the individual George Orwell had absolutely no agency in terms of rejecting those codes. So, he wanted to reject those codes, he wanted to uh, not conform to the codes, but that option was unavailable to him, right. So, obviously, he had to conform and enact that particular code uh, in a very performative kind of a way. So, in order to preserve his identity, in order to consolidate his identity as an imperial officer. So, uh, identity obviously is a very uh, you know interesting, is a very intimate uh, issue especially in terms of gender because identity is sometimes subverted through gender behavior, identity is sometimes conformed, uh, consolidated through gender behavior, uh, identity is sometimes disrupted dramatically uh, in through gender behavior. So, identity is a very complex phenomenon. Uh, it's a combination, as I uh, as I said uh, a few times earlier as well. It's a combination of neural, embodied, uh, internal uh, mechanism as well as external, ideological, discursive mechanisms. So you know the two combined together in very sort of complex combinations, in order to give you an idea of embodied identity. So identity, of course, is related to embodiment. Uh, and embodiment, of course, is a very complex category uh, you know, of combination. Uh, recombination and inscription. So, you inscribe your embodiment to a language, to your body, uh, you know, to your gendered identity. So, all these terms are related to each other uh, in very complex ways, but at the same time, uh, even in very superficial levels, they are connected. And as we have seen uh, in each of the literary texts that we have studied or examined in this particular course. Uh, so, you know, we, in, in Shooting the Elephant by Orwell, we saw how the code of gendered behavior uh, is not just limited to gender, it is also uh, you know, brings into consideration race, uh, politics, uh, obviously skin color uh, in this in, in this particular situation, uh, and obviously the imperial climate. So, if this had been uh, a post-imperial Burma, and no one would have expected the white officer, the white uh, police officer, uh, to uh, you know, enact this heroic, um, you know, execution of the elephant, the mad elephant. So, the only reason why he was expected to enact this heroic performative act was because uh, you know he, he was you know he was an imperial officer stationed in Burma it was his job uh, you know it was sort of presupposed uh, to be his job uh, to perform this kind of a, a controlling of a particular uh, a potential chaos and elephant obviously represented a potential chaos which he had to uh, control and 
uh, you know, confine and contain. So obviously he did not want to do it uh, at an individual uh, agentic level. He did not want to do it, uh, but that his individual private agency was sort of completely redundant uh, in, in the face of this bigger ideological will, the bigger you know, discursive will which he had to conform to. So again, uh, and this is something I have been saying uh, for a while now, that gender should not be studied uh, as, a, uh, as a separate isolated phenomenon. It is something which is uh, constantly uh, and in a very complexly uh, influenced by race, by ethnicity, by language, by political climate, by political location, by racial location, by linguistic location, etc. Uh, and also other factors such as religion, food, uh, dress code, etc. Right? So, in a, in a case of always shooting an elephant, it is very clear that you know, the identity of the imperial white officer you know, is also because of its whiteness. It is not just about its manliness, but also because of its whiteness. I mean, there were other Burmese men, uh, but no, no one really thought of you know, shooting the elephant. The only, the only person who was expected to shoot the elephant was the white imperial officer stationed in Burma. So, you know, so, oh, th th these, I mean, th th these are the factors, these are the combinations which keep coming back uh, in any un reading of gender, in any understanding of gender. Right? And so, you cannot possibly divorce gender from these other uh, vectors from these other coordinates uh, uh, such as race, such as ethnicity, such as politics, such as culture, uh, such as language uh, you know, and you can, uh, you can name many more factors as well. Right? So, you know, we saw that in shooting an elephant, but also when it came to uh, when you arrive at something like heart of darkness uh, which is quite explicitly racial, uh, explicitly divided racially. So, you have this uh, African people in the Congo who never speak, uh, their third person presences because they are spoken about, uh, they are represented. Uh, through the prism of the white man. So, no, no uh, African, no non-white person speaks in Heart of Darkness. So, no subaltern speaks in Heart of Darkness, uh, which is again a very political thing. The silence of a subaltern in Heart of Darkness is very political silence, like most silences are in political situations. So, in Heart of Darkness, we see uh, it, the question of representation becomes problematic because you know the white man wants to represent uh, the experience of the non-white space, but he fails to do it. And why does he fail to do it? Because he is using the mechanism, uh, the rational narrative mechanism of the white man, which does not work, which does not work you know, to describe uh, a situation which has nothing to do with white rational morality. So, he is in a space, again the question of space becomes important, something which we uh, spent a lot of time with uh, in the last lecture. Uh, you know, he is in a space which where this rational mechanism, this white Christian rational mechanism will not work. And again, this is a very clear indication of the relativist location of morality, of rationality, of gender identity and uh, dependent on particular spaces. So, if only in certain spaces will that mechanism, will that apparatus be operative. So, it will not be operative in certain other spaces like when what happens in the Congo cannot be described using a rational narrative network of the white man. And so, the entire narrative of Heart of Darkness is an anti-narrative in that sense, it is an anti-novel in that sense. The entire novel is about the failure to write a novel, the failure to tell a story of what happened in the Congo. Okay? So, this is what uh, transpires in Heart of Darkness. So, again we see gender in Heart of Darkness is a very, very uh, complex combination of race, uh, spatial location, ideological location. So, you know Marlow by the end of Heart of Darkness is moved away uh, from looking at imperialism unequivocally as a noble Christian enterprise. So, he is more ambivalent about imperialism by the end of Heart of Darkness, he is more ambivalent about the goodness of imperialism. So, he is not sure if imperialism is a good thing or a bad thing. So, he is sort of tending, he is gravitating, he is shifting towards looking at imperialism as a negative enterprise and that obviously uh, affects his embodiment, that obviously affects his gender identity. So, no longer is he a strong white man, uh, he is now a neurotic nervous white man uh, because of this political ambivalence. So, again something like political ambivalence, something like emotional ambivalence, it affects your gendered embodiment. So, Marlowe is far from being uh, the potent, clinical, complete, adequate masculine self. So, he is this nervous, neurotic, unreliable uh, you know, uh, male narrator who really cannot go on with the story, who cannot really complete the story uh, and who is sort of, who is extremely uh, you know given to nervous, uh, nervous experiences, who is extremely given to nervous conditions uh, and which affects his gender identity. So, he is really uh, nowhere uh, you know comparable to a quote unquote hegemonic male self. So, there is no hegemony in heart of darkness, there is no dominant male self in heart of darkness and a woman in heart of darkness they appear uh, as they represented as apparitions. Uh, so, they, they are exotic presences or very passive presences uh, you know whose uh, entire location in the novel is, uh, is very, very problematic. 
So they are, uh, you know, their negotiation with patriarchy, their negotiation with capitalism, the negotiation with imperialism is very, very complex. Uh, so we have uh, the, the novel, the, the woman in the Belgian office before Marlow goes off to Africa, they sit there like, you know, uh, sort of ominous apparitions. So he's very threatened by the presence. It's very, he feels almost castrated by the presence. He feels as if they're gazing at him in a way which makes him unsettled. And then, of course, uh, the other woman who appears in Heart of Darkness subsequently is Crucis Intended, uh, you know, who doesn't speak, but who's exoticized uh, systematically uh, for the male imagination. So the entire European white male imagination exoticizes herself. And again, look at the way how the representation of gender is done through the prism of race, uh, is done through the prism of a political condition such as imperialism. So if Marlowe had gone there as a tourist and not as an imperial officer, his representation of the woman may have been completely different uh, you know, from that of what he actually does in Heart of Darkness. So again, the location of Marlowe as an imperial, uh, imperial agent, not an officer, as an imperial agent who works in a, uh, in, in a particular company in, in, in Congo, a Belgian company which uh, obviously sells ivory and is a completely exploitative company. Uh, he walks there. And you know, it is through that prism of the worker in an imperial company that he sees the woman in, in Africa. And so his representation of the woman is sort of completely uh, affected by his location, uh, where he is uh, you know, emotionally, illogically, uh, and also existentially. So obviously, the other woman in Heart of Darkness, uh, Kurtz's intended, uh, doesn't speak except uh, in very, very moral, elegant, mourning tones. So he's a very, uh, in a romantic, she's a very romantic mourner. So she mourns for the death of the romantic hero. She thinks is a romantic hero. So Kurtz's death too is a very gendered phenomenon. So Kurtz, Kurtz is preserved in the European imagination, uh, in the female white imagination, the white female imagination as a romantic hero, as someone who you know, gave his life for a very good cause. But obviously we know, we know different, we know better. We know that he died a very sorry death uh, having become something of a, uh, you know, a machine, an automaton, uh, you know, consumed by greed, consumed by, uh, you know, you know, the drive to make more profit, and also became a rogue agent of imperialism, uh, and so, uh, you know, he died a very, very tragic death. But of course, uh, he also died a death with the knowledge of his nothingness, right? So again, knowledge, uh, as we mentioned in *Heart of Darkness*, something as abstract and something as uh, inanimate, quote unquote, inanimate as knowledge. Two is deeply gendered in Heart of Darkness, right? So, you know, it's a knowledge which is accessible only to men. So, Kurtz has a first hand knowledge of the horror of imperialism. Marlowe has a second hand knowledge of the horror of imperialism. And Marlowe's male listeners have a third hand knowledge of the horrors of imperialism. But, of course, uh, the, the female in Heart of Darkness, uh, the European female in Heart of Darkness, who Marlowe comes back to, uh, she is deliberately lied to, uh, you know, in terms of. Uh, really knowing what transpired or transpires uh, in the colony. So she, she's not told. She, she still keeps consuming this notion of imperialism as a noble grand uh, narrative of uh, you know, rescuing mission, civilizing mission, etc. Right? So she is misinformed and she's lied to in every which way, in every sense of the term. So again, knowledge becomes a deeply problematic, discursive, and gendered entity, a category in Heart of Darkness. So this is in keeping with what I've been saying uh, in throughout this course, that you know, we need to look at gender uh, beyond the human uh, category. We need to look at gender beyond the organic category. It's not just about uh, man and woman and animals uh, and the organic animate life. It's also equally about the inanimate uh, entities who are discursively filled with gendered uh, you know, uh, identifications, with gendered markers. Uh, you know, markers of certain kind of genders. Of course, this markers is mutable, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, everything about gender is mutable. It's sort of changeable, mutable. Uh, it changes according to the external conditions, uh, the external political, cultural, ideological conditions. They all govern the change which informs, uh, you know, gendered identities. So the, the main thing that I would like you to take from this course is an understanding of gender as a text. Right? So gender is a textual category, and like every text, it is textually produced uh, through a variety of abstract uh, and material apparatus. Right? And of course, the, 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 the merge of the material and abstract apparatus in the case of gender is a very asymmetric merge. We can't really quantify or calibrate it uh, in its entirety. But the reproduction of gender as a text is something that we should be aware of as students of gender. Right? Because that would enable us uh, to not consume gender unquestioningly, 
right? So this is something we are aware of. This is something that we are very, very, uh, you know, we should be sensitive to the textual production of gender as a, as a category of knowledge, as a category of embodiment, as a category of location, as a category of privilege, as a category of loss, right? So because, you know, gender is something uh, which, uh, which we, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this course, is something that you suffer sometimes, is something that you enjoy sometimes, is something that you are privileged with sometimes. Okay, so you know it's a very textual mode of production. So the textuality of gender is something that we should be deeply aware of in, in, in the course of this study, right? So all the literary texts that we have studied, uh, they were they were looking at gender from a textual perspective. I mean, we we read those texts, uh, we read those uh, short stories, uh, you know, uh, the novel, the drama, you know, in terms of a text. Uh, in a, a text which uh, reflects, is reflective uh, of the gender condition of that particular time. So again, you know, this is something I've been said, I've said it enough already. So I'll just say it one more time. The gender as a textual production is deeply dependent uh, on the cultural condition which produces it. Like any text, uh, it's produced out of a certain cultural condition and gender is no exception, right? So the entire production of gender as a text is reliant on the cultural condition of its time. So, you know, when the cultural conditions change, when the coordinates of the cultural conditions change as they do in Prim Chan's, uh, you know, Shatran Shakilari, the gendered identities change as well. This, uh, they can move from being the center to the margin, from the margin to the center. So all these change, they are they're open, they're susceptible to change. They are plastic, mutable categories of knowledge. So um, the texts that we studied, uh, they are deeply reflective of the cultural conditioning of gender, of the mutability of gender. So in, for instance, in Mansfield's Fly, uh, the boss, the protagonist in the short story, the boss, he travels eventually from being this dominant uh, male self who's rational, in control, uh, stoic, uh, this very, very strategic mourner, the strategic rememberer of loss. From that position, he moves on to very quickly, not quickly, to a very painful process of loss to someone who is completely liquidated as a human being, someone who's completely impoverished as a human being. Uh, someone has sort of moved away definitely from the position of privilege. So by the time we come to the end of the story uh, in Mansfield's Fly, no longer is the boss uh, enjoying his particular gendered identity. So he's suffering his gendered identity because it's, it's spectacularly relevant, it's spectacularly evident, sorry, that he is uh, you know, a frail old man as well, just waiting for his death to come and consume him. So no longer is he in control of his life, no longer is in control of time, no longer is in control of memory, but uh, as the last line, the last sentence of the story reveals, for the life of him, he could not remember. So he could not really remember his own self, his old self, his stronger self. So now he's just a frail old figure in a muffler waiting for the loss to happen and consume him. So again, the entire story, in the course of one short story, uh, you know, there's a movement which is very palpable from the position of privilege to a position of poverty, uh, and a poverty of uh, an existential poverty. Really, so you know, even a, a very short story like Fly is so loaded uh, in terms of its gendered location. And of course, the woman in, in the Fly, uh, you know, is, is, is a, a short story populated almost entirely by senile old decadent men uh, who are waiting for the deaths to happen. And the women are so the absent presences. There's no mention of the boss's wife and Woodyfield's wife and daughters. They are the mobile people. They go out, they go out of this mourning metropolis. They actually go to the site of loss. To, to really see the place where the loss is preserved. They, they, they go to Belgium uh, and see the graveyard of the boss's son and Woodyfield's son, and they come, come back and give the reports to their husbands who do not move, uh, who, do not, who are unable to move. So again, the entire gendered map uh, of power, privilege, and poverty is sort of inverted in, in, in the fly. So we have these old men uh, who otherwise uh, Sort of, they, they should be posi enjoying positions of power, positions of privilege, but instead we see them mourning, grieving, uh, not able to remember. We see them so almost amnesic. You know, they can't really remember what happened to them, and that obviously affects the embodiment. That obviously is, you know, compromises the embodiment to a great extent, uh, to the point that uh, you know the entire gendered identity uh, is sort of, you know, it, it changes in the course of this uh, short story. So, Fly is a very important short story, despite its brevity. It's a very important short story which gives you a very fun example of the movement of gender from a position of privilege to a position of loss, right? So how these identities are configured and reconfigured, coded and uncoded and recoded uh, through various social, existential, and political conditions, right? So by the time we come to Heart of Darkness, which is the final uh, text which we covered in this particular uh, course, we find, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a classic example of the textuality of gendered identity. So Colonel Redfern, 
who is Alison's father uh, in the drama. So he used to enjoy a position of privilege in terms of gender identity. So he was this imperial uh, officer stationed in India. So he was obviously leading the Maharaja's army, as we are told. Uh, you know, he was someone who's very used to being waited upon. You know, suddenly the political coordinates change. Uh, India become independent, uh, and imperialism comes to an end. And he finds himself back to Britain uh, in, uh, in England. He doesn't really recognize where he's not really the hero anymore. Where he's really not someone who's looked up to anymore. He's just a nobody, and he can't come to terms with it. So again. His gendered location, like the boss in the Mansfield's Fly, moves from a position of privilege to a position of powerlessness. So he's completely confused. He's sort of existentially, politically, uh, you know, emotionally confused uh, in this particular play. Now, when it comes to Jimmy Porter in Heart of Darkness, we find him quite clearly uh, embodying and exhibiting uh, a, a, a form of gendered exhaustion. So his masculinity is a very exhausted masculinity. He doesn't quite know uh, how to assert himself except uh, screaming from his armchair uh, very, very ineffectually. Right? So he is someone who doesn't know, uh, you know his location in life. So again, Heart of Darkness is a very classic example of how gendered identities are permeated and you know, um, you know, affected by class identities. So Jimmy Porter's identity as a working class hero is really uh, you know, interesting because on the one hand, it comes from an educational background. He's been to university thanks to the 1944 Education Act, which you know, enabled him to get free education. Uh, and of course, that didn't give him a job. Uh, so he finds himself running a sweet stall despite his education. So he's somewhere uh, located between classes. So it's a very liminal position. We talked about liminality uh, in the earlier lecture. So again, his entire liminal position in terms of the general identity is something that we need to be aware of when we're looking at how to darkness. And of course, there are other characters in how to darkness who embody different kinds of general identity with different moral uh, luggage. Uh, you know, um, Alison, uh, Jimmy's, Jimmy's wife, she obviously comes from a privileged imperial background, but now, like her father, she finds herself in a position uh, you know, where she's confused, where she doesn't know how to fit in. Uh, she's married to this person who is a working class person, but at the same time, a university educated person, and she doesn't quite know how to deal with that situation. And so she suffers a loss in every sense of the word. She, she suffer, her loss is biological, her loss is physical, her loss is tragic. So she's a truly tragic character in Look Back in Anger. So she becomes a recipient of violence, male violence, abuse uh, from, uh, from her husband, uh, you know, neglect from her family. So she, she emerges as someone you know, who can be seen as a symptom uh, of the, the condition of England at that time. So it's not really a male-centered play. So you know, the, there's a dominant reading of Look Back in Anger looking at it as a male-centered play. But I look at Alison Redfern in Look Back in Anger as perhaps the most complex character in Look Back in Anger. Because she moves in a position of privilege to loss, but at the same time, her entire identity is mediated by the male presence around her. So she, hers is a truly tragic character. Hers is a truly tragic condition. And of course, by the time the play ends, they get to know that she has suffered a loss in terms of losing a child. And she comes back uh, you know, to her husband, claiming that she has suffered enough to be compatible to him, compatible with him, uh, which is obviously a huge, uh, it's a very regressive stance to take, uh, you know, something which is truly tragic and dark, because it doesn't really give her the independence and autonomy and agency to stand up on her own, because she's unable to do it in the context of these times, and the, the cultural, political context of these times, the class context of these times will not allow her to do it. Right? So she comes back uh, and returns as Jimmy's wife, uh, having suffered the loss of the child, which will not allow her will now become, you know, make her compatible uh, in terms of her, you know, shared suffering with Jimmy, which is a very, very male-centric position to take. If, you know, it's a very male-centric reading of Look Back in Anger, one which must be critiqued and decoded uh, and, and obviously uh, textualized in the context of the play. Now, so these are the literary texts which we studied. Uh, and each of the texts, as I mentioned, uh, you know, they looked at gender. And we looked at gender you know, while reading these texts as textual category, uh, as something which is produced and reproduced and unproduced, and obviously something which is mutable and something which you know, flowed between, like a floating signifier between different other categories of knowledge, location, and identification. Now, when we came to the last segment uh, of this, uh, you know, of this course, when we looked at the advertisements, uh, the, the popular advertisements, the popular media representing gender, the representations of gender in popular media. So we find that even in mainstream media, even in media you know, consumed by quote unquote liberal, uh, you know, educated people, and uh, we find a huge amount of sexist binaries. So it's very dualistic, uh, you know, sexist binaries where we talk about men behaving in a particular way, men desiring a certain thing, women desiring certain other things, and two never mix with each other. There's sort of complete division 
engendered identity and desire is something that we, you know, we, you know, it's almost shocking when you see advertisements such as you know, the Heineken advertisement or the fair and handsome advertisement which we saw. Uh, you know, and you know, the, the entire idea is to sort of consolidate the division between the men and the women, between the male and the female, and to look at desire as a gendered category as well. So desire, an effect, you know, you know, obviously it's an effect, and it's an effect of, an effect of association, an effect of you know, affiliation. Uh, you know, but that too becomes quite gendered, uh, you know, in certain advertisements which we saw uh, in the course of this, uh, of this, of this particular, you know, the the the, the, the teaching plan that we had uh, in the last couple of lectures. So when you remember, uh, you know, the entire, you know, the the, the the entire discourse in the Yorkie advertisement, which was very interesting because, as I mentioned, Yorkie as a chocolate, it, it wanted to rebrand itself as a male chocolate. Uh, but then w one would imagine that to be a very radical thing, but it counter essentializes it. So, you know, it essentializes uh, the chocolate as, ma as male. Uh, so, uh, on the one hand, it is critiquing perhaps, not critiquing, but it's breaking away from the essentialist understanding of chocolate as a female form of consumption. But on the other hand, it ends up eventually as an essentialized male consumption, which must be, uh, you know, earned and not purchased. Right? So, at the end of Yorkie the advertisement, you know, what, what is shown to us quite clearly and quite evidently is that, you know, this particular chocolate becomes uh, a form of, it's not really a commodity, but it's a super commodity in the sense that it, must not, it cannot be really purchased. Uh, it must be acquired, it must be deserved, it must be earned through some metonymic markers of masculinity. Uh, and if you don't have those markers, you know, you, you don't really get the chocolate at all, which is obviously a very problematic depiction of a commodity, uh, branding it so, so heavily uh, and so heavy handedly uh, as masculine or feminine. So this particular advertisement we saw was quite complex. And of course, uh, when you see uh, advertisements like the Axe Clicker, uh, which was a deodorant advertisement that we saw, we found that how the, the you know, it, it sort of looks at the, you know, the transgender, the, the other desire uh, that we see in this particular advertisement. That, you know, we see this black gay person looking at this desirable white male body. But how interestingly, that particular gaze, uh, this black gay gaze, how that is quickly converted into a female gaze. Right, because that's a very convenient thing to do. Because you know, then we have the same binary principle in operation that is consolidated, that, that is preserved. In other words, right? We don't really have a third case. We don't really have a third location of gender at all. That possibility is thwarted uh, in this particular uh, advertisement, and we see instead how that is very quickly converted into uh, a heteronormative kind of a case, uh, and that is added to the count that is sort of quantified, uh, you know, in the, in the very very numerical understanding of. Uh, heteronormative gaze, which we see in, in the particular advertisement, the axe clicker advertisement. And of course, the commodity at the end of the advertisement, it appears as an intervention of this kind of a fantasy. It appears as an intervention of this kind of a gaze. Because, you know, what we see at the end of the advertisement is that the person who is, um, you know, uh, inferiorly embodied, you know, is not really, you know, a superior embodied person, is an inferiorly embodied person in terms of his physical size, in terms of his looks, in terms of his objective. Uh, you know, uh, you know, embodiment in that kind of a cultural location. I mean, there's no such thing as objective embodiment, but it's objective in as much as it is, you know, uh, re relevant to that particular cultural location. In that particular culture of desire, he's, you know, objectively speaking, in that particular culture of desire, he is someone who is inferior in terms of his embodiment. But however, that inferiority can be bypassed by consuming that particular commodity. So that, that particular deodorant that we see at the end of the ax clicker, uh, you know, that would elevate him uh, in, in, at, at an embodied level and would give him the, the ticket, the license, uh, the access to a very privileged position of desire, of being desired, you know, at. So he's sort of looked at, he's gazed at, and that too has been quantified, of course, uh, you know, by his clicker as well. Right? And finally, uh, the last lecture, which we so almost entirely spent on looking at you know, the relationship between gender and space, we found out how interestingly uh, you know, the, the spatial production of gender actually corroborates the textual process. The fact that we just said the gender is a textual production, and that is corroborated actually by the very speciality of the production, the very spatial nature of the production, how that is sort of related to a particular space. If you divorce it from a space and put it in a different space, there will be a different kind of production. So Johnny Fontana, um, in that particular scene of The Godfather, he would have been a very masculine person, perhaps in a different kind of space. But because he finds himself in a mafia space, a Machiavellian 
clinically cold men uh, who are basically contract killers and discuss these kind of you know, details in very cold uh, precision. You know, he finds himself uh, inadequately masculine in that kind of a setting, despite his biological maleness. So, you know, he becomes uh, an insufficient embodiment, an instance of an insufficient gendered identity in that particular space, only in that particular space. And somewhere else he might be an alpha male, and somewhere else he might be a dominant male, and somewhere else he might be a hegemonic male. But because he finds himself in that kind of a setting, uh, he is obviously the non-hegemonic, um, you know, masculine self who is laughed at, who is jeered at, who is lampooned in a very grotesque kind of a way and eventually sent off, you know, uh, to this female space where, uh, you know, he, he inhabits, uh, you know, because of his insufficient masculinity. So again, the, the idea of insufficient masculinity, the idea of a dominant masculinity is very space-based. Right? And there is no objective understanding of this. The, the, the entire idea is relatively produced. It is a relative reproduction uh, of masculinity, femininity and the coded quality of these reproductions. Right? So, we need to be aware of the coded quality of these reproductions to be, you know, do, do a full and faithful study of scenes like this. So just to conclude my uh, reading, it is absolutely imperative for us who are students of gender, uh, who are interested in gender, especially the way gender is reflected and represented uh, in uh, different cultural media, uh, in, in literary media, in cinematic media, in visual media. It is absolutely imperative for us to be aware, uh, to be sensitive, uh, to look out for the for the textual encoded quality of such uh, you know, representations. Right? And it is also equally important for us uh, to be aware and sensitive to the cultural condition which produces those codes in the first place. So, what would be a certain kind of a coded production in a western liberal world, uh, a quote unquote western white liberal world would be quite different uh, from the codes of production which m m go into the making of gender identities in a non-western world. Right? Um, say for instance, what would be uh, a, a particular gendered identity in Lebanon would be quite different from the you know, same uh, kind of gendered identity in London. So, London and Lebanon would have very different codes of gendered identities uh, for men, for women, for children, for inanimate matters. You know, because you know, the entire idea uh, that I want you to take from this particular course is that the, the context sensitivity of this course is very, very important. So, the very coded quality is because of its context sensitivity. So, you cannot study the course by taking away the context. So, if you are looking at the Lebanese kind of masculinity and a Londonesque kind of masculinity, the Lebanese femininity and the Londonesque fem femininity is absolutely imperative that you do a cultural study of that particular context. Only then will you be able to find out or decode you know, the process to which the identities are formed and reformed and, you know, and move on and consolidate and become dominant or marginalized and so on. So, uh, this brings us to the conclusion of this course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, you know, studying it. I hope you enjoyed looking at the text that we did. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you take away something permanent from this course. And of course, uh, you know, hopefully this will give you some ideas, the, 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 the idea of gender as a text, the, the idea of gender as a code, the idea of gender as a performance, the idea of gender as an embodiment, the idea of gender as a process to which uh, you attain an identity and then of course you reproduce it and you deconstruct it uh, to different kinds of cultural vectors. So, all these ideas would hopefully help you, uh, help you in the times to come in terms of looking at gender uh, from more complex perspectives, uh, you know, not just in academic circles, not just in uh, intellectual circles, but also uh, in the very daily mundane uh, reality around us that we consume and internalize every day. Right? So, the point is to question the consumption, uh, to interrupt the consumption, uh, you know, uh, to sort of deconstruct that consumption uh, and ask some uncomfortable questions about why we consume in a way we do consume. Uh, and and that was one, that, that's the one thing I would like you to take from this particular course. So, I hope you enjoyed doing this course and I look forward to seeing you again in the times to come. Thank you very much.